Hey everyone, voiceover Mike here. I hope you're happy, healthy, and safe, and welcome back to the channel. Boy, it's been a wild, surprising, and very busy summer. In fact, so wild, surprising, and busy that it's been tough to find time to make these videos. But hey, being busy is a good thing, right? One such project that kept me busy recently was this 1964 Fender Jaguar. It came my way via Ian, who had just inherited the guitar from his uncle, who sadly passed not too long ago. As I understand the story, he'd had this guitar for a long, long time, but didn't play it. Now, Ian is a great musician and hopes to put this old jag into heavy rotation, and that's exactly the kind of thing that I love to hear. After all, these guitars were meant to be played, so I'm going to be putting a lot of effort in to bring it back into fighting shape. Now, being that it hadn't been played in seemingly decades, the Jag needed a spa day, as it were. The finish was dull and cloudy, frets corroded from disuse, wiring scratchy as hell, and worst of all, the guitar had seen some water damage in storage at some point, evident by the cracked, loose finish on the lower bout and a matching spot in the case itself. And that case! Let's talk about the case. It not only reeked of mildew, but there were also years and years of caked on grime and tar stuck to the outside. Granted, cases are there to protect the guitar, so it's good that it had that barrier around it, but I mean, just look at it. And because it's that rare 63-64 blonde case, beautiful as they are, I decided that I couldn't just clean up the guitar and then stick it back in a dirty, gross-smelling case without spending a couple of hours deep cleaning it. After scrubbing with a damp sponge and some simple green later on, I vacuumed the interior and I let it soak up some sun rays until the mildew scent was nigh undetectable. Let me toot my own horn here, this case came out great. Night and day difference. And with the case cleaned up, well, it was time to deep, and I mean deep, clean the guitar. Before we get too deep into it, a shout out to my supporters on Patreon who got an extra long, extra detailed cut of this very video. If you too are interested in bonus content or just supporting the channel, hit the links in the description down below. First step, removing the strings. They were old and corroded and dead sounding, they didn't hold tune, and they needed to go. They were also lighter than I would normally recommend for a Jaguar, so after talking with Ian about his playstyle and his needs, we opted to restring it later with Ernie Ball 11-52s. That's the Burley Slinky set. This is what I consider to be a great medium light set for a short scale guitar like a Jaguar, a Mustang, or a Duo Sonic. The plan here is to get this guitar to its most stable, basic level of playability before any other mods take place. We're keeping everything original for the moment so that Ian can play it for a while, then reevaluate if he wants to, say, change the string gauge or swap in a different bridge. Ah, but we're not there yet. To get it to that state, I'll be totally dismantling the guitar so I can put it all back together again, better than before. I remove the vibrato arm and pull the bridge, revealing some old scotch tape wrapped around the bridge posts. Folks do this sometimes to keep the bridge from rocking as designed. Not my favorite way to do it. It always feels like the soft tape dampens the sound of the guitar a bit, but it's a lot of people's first step in offset modding. I'm cutting and removing the tape. Like I said, we're going for basic, proper functionality, so we're going to get this bridge rocking as intended. When set up correctly, it's perfectly stable. Off comes the mute assembly too, which needs to be cleared away to remove the pickguard. The foam on the mute as well as under the pickups has deteriorated into a sticky black goop, so that's all going to get replaced. Next, the neck. I'm pulling it off the body to clean and polish the frets, which you can see from this angle are brown with corrosion. And check out the original fiber shims! The neck plays great as it is, so we'll be keeping those too. I'm also taking this opportunity to note the neck heel date stamp. 1 Aug 63. Let's decode that. The 1? That's not a day of the month, that's the model code. 1 in this era is for Jaguar, 2 for Strat, 3 for Telecaster, 4 for Jazzmaster, 6 for Base 6, and so on. Aug for August, and 63 for 1963. Now, usually there's a final letter on these which indicates nut width. A being 1 and a half inches, B 1 and 5 eighths, C 1 and 3 quarters, and D 1 and 7 eighths. This guitar has the standard nut width of 1 and 5 eighths inches, so it's clearly missing its B, 
but hey, that happens. Now, remember at the beginning where I said this was a 64 Jaguar? At this point, I still reckon the guitar to be from 1963 based on the neck date stamp, the pot date codes being the 36th week of 1963, the general feature set, and the case itself. But whether it's other humans or guitars, dating is a process, and later one more clue would be revealed that would give us the true age of the guitar. The not as old, possibly original, but also shimmed on the treble side. The likely reason for this is that the neck had developed a back bow from the fifth fret backward toward the headstock. It still didn't play cleanly though, and that combined with the extreme fret wear in the first position meant that there was more work to be done, but we'll come back to that. Before I do anything else, I'm cleaning. Starting with a cloth and the body, I get as much surface dirt off the thing as possible, but it's here that I notice a very clear line around the guard and metal plates where you can see a lot of buildup. So I decide to remove them all so I can better buff the body. I've mentioned pick guard shrinkage before, numerous times I believe, but if you're not aware, these old celluloid guards tend to shrink as they age, causing the screws to tilt inward on the body, restricting the ability to adjust the pickup height, and generally making it difficult to get them back on again. This goes double for a Jaguar guard and all of its components which are placed within the perimeter of the guard. We're talking the switch pod, we're talking the pickups, we're talking the bridge thimbles. To mitigate this, I always keep spare wood or other bodies around so that I have something to screw the pick guard onto. This keeps the pick guard from shrinking while it's off the original body. So onto the 50th anniversary body it goes, as well as a spare left-handed Ronsky plate to make sure that everything goes back on as it should. Now for the foam. <sighs> God, this stuff is disgusting. What used to be springy foam is now a thick, sticky tar that gets all over your hands and everything else it touches. And it can even wreak havoc on wires and pickups if left unchanged. So it's best to toss it and replace it with good, stiff, modern foam. I usually use the stuff that Fender sells direct or I get some from Stumac, but I'm out. So spare Lawler foam it is. Ooh. Ugh, gross. After I cleared off the leftover adhesive from the mute plate using a box cutter blade, I packed the foam into a small Ziploc bag so I can give it back to Ian. Moving on to the frets, woof. They needed a lot of attention. Thankfully, the first pass with steel wool made a huge difference. I always clean using a side to side motion rather than going up and down the fretboard to keep from leaving fine scratches on the frets that you will definitely feel as you bend a string. I do one more pass of steel wool to really get in that space between the edge of the fret and the fretboard, then finish off with some lemon oil. This hydrates and conditions the veneer Brazilian rosewood fretboard, and I mean, it's stunning. Look at that piece of wood. Dark, chocolatey, beautiful. After wiping away the excess, I grab my favorite guitar polish, which isn't actually guitar polish at all. It's Meguiar's Show Car Glaze, a super fine compound that's great for removing dirt, haze, swirls, all of that from old nitro finishes while restoring the nice vintage sheen to which we are all accustomed. And this finish needed that desperately. It was not fun to touch, I'll say that much. I'm not only doing the back of the neck here, but I'm also doing the face of the headstock to get rid of the haze left from the case. Here I'm taking off the string tree and tuners so that I can get full access to the headstock face. Here at the last minute, I decide Meguiar's just isn't gonna cut it alone. The grime, the cloudiness, it may not look that bad on camera, but in person, it felt like a layer of film on top of what should be a bright, clean finish. I opted for naphtha, a solvent that's frequently used in guitar cleaning to cut through all of that stuff, and I'm really glad I did it because even on the headstock, the haze was extreme. After a few passes with some paper towels which left them yellow with grime, I moved on to Meguiar's. Here I'm not trying to make this finish look glossy and brand new, I'm just bringing it back to what old lacquer looks like when it's kept clean. It shined up beautifully. Satisfied, I reinstall the tuners in their original positions and the string tree, and I move on to the body. I go ahead and clean off my workspace, and then I pause to use naphtha to get the last of that old adhesive off the mute plate. Then I get to work cleaning the body, using more naphtha to loosen the bulk of the buildup before I go in there and really buff it up. With the overhead shot here, you can get a much better sense of how grimy the whole guitar was. I always apply show car glaze to the cloth first and then wipe a coat on the body, wait a moment, and then I buff it away. The stuff is magic. I mean, look at the difference here. Let's have a side by side. 
Now, before any of you leave comments about wiping away the mojo, I have some news for you. There's no such thing as mojo. Mojo is a term that's bandied about by people who just don't want to clean their guitars. And hey, choice is yours. I'm not here to tell you you're wrong. I'm just saying mojo is made up. I finish up the polishing stage with a soft, dry cloth, and then I move on to replacing that pickup foam. Now, when the Jag came in, the neck pickup did not work, which I originally believed to be the cause of some bad solder joints, maybe at the switch, maybe at the terminals on the pickup itself. So I grabbed my multimeter, I put the probes on the pickups, and I hope for a reading of around 6K, but just look at that number. No, 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 no. The coil has a short in it. The pickup needs to be rewound. For that, Ian and I chatted about some options and eventually decided on Sunday handwound. Tim is a great pickup maker and offers rewinds at a shockingly affordable price, so I pulled the pickup and shipped it off to him immediately in Georgia. Later, I installed a spare EP custom that I had laying around so that the guard wouldn't constrict. I reinstalled the guard, reflowed some solder joints, and cleaned the pots. Now, even though I had the guard screwed onto a body, that doesn't prevent the guard from shrinking while you're trying to put it back on. This one wasn't too bad, but I always keep a hairdryer handy for this procedure in case I need to coax a guard back into shape. It's just hot enough to get the guard to stretch, but not hot enough to hurt the guitar's finish. Or cause a fire, because celluloid is flammable. Would you just look at this? My God, what a guitar. What a damn fine guitar. This is beautiful. With everything back on the body and the neck reattached, it's time for a setup. And this part went really smoothly. Since we reused the original fiber shims, the neck angle didn't need to change at all. Fender did a great job of putting enough inclination on the neck for stability, but also for the bridge to clear the mute, which engages smoothly with just a little bit of adjustment. I have an older video about setting up the mute that I will link to in the description down below. With Ernie Ball 11 to 52 strings, this Jag came alive, loud and proud, and best of all, stable even with heavy downstrokes. This is how a good Jaguar should play. But this is not the end of the story. After getting the guitar strung up and play tested, it became clear that for it to play its level best, I'd need to address the next backward bow. It's not currently enough to warrant heat treatment, but the back bow, combined with deep fretware, meant that it was impossible to play a clean chord anywhere below the fifth fret. So, I recommended to Ian that we replace the first three frets, level them to the bow, and then level and crown the rest of the frets to match. And I'm glad we did that, because after the work, the Jag plays perfectly. When Ian picked up the guitar, he couldn't even tell which frets I'd replaced, which made me feel really good about my work. And I didn't even have to replace the nut, although we may at some point in the future. Like I said, I just wanted to get this guitar into its basic best level of playability so that Ian can reevaluate down the line. We got a good setup coming on. Look at these strings. They stay in place. The mute works. The vibrato is vibratoing. This thing is Unreal. Once the original neck pickup came back from Tim, I reinstalled it immediately, and I have to tell you, it sounds just as good as it's supposed to. Stellar work here from Sunday Handwound, but Tim also discovered something that I hadn't yet noticed. On the bottom of the pickups, beneath the metal claw, were yellow date stamps reading March 11 of 1964. And as you well know, an all-original guitar is only as old as its youngest component. So while much of this guitar dates from 1963, the pickups tell us that this guitar most likely left the factory in or just after March of 1964. I don't know about you, but I love this stuff. I'm happy to report that Ian appears to be over the moon with this amazing Jaguar. Not every old guitar is a winner. It's true that there's always variation in the line, but my god, this one certainly is a winner. It plays like a dream in its stock configuration, it has a huge, clear electric voice, and a super smooth vibrato. It's a great example of the Jaguar sound, and I am ecstatic that I got to meet it. Well, that about wraps up the video. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Like I said, it's been a busy summer, but I've got a few more vids in the works, so stay tuned. Until then, I hope you're taking care of yourselves and each other. I hope you're having fun with guitars, and I'll see you in the next video.